Hi, Casey. Welcome to the show. Hi, Casey. <laughs> so for the benefit of uh, all our audience, could you please briefly introduce yourself? Yeah, I uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Steve and Ted for inviting me to this uh, wonderful pod, uh, podcast. Uh, as I just told them that uh, uh, it's a very useful uh, uh, platform for learning about personal finance, investing, that kind of, stuff, that kind of things, you see. Uh, so very good. Uh, I I also noticed there are a lot of activities in the uh, in the platform. That's very good. Uh, okay, uh, I uh, I was working as a civil engineer for many years uh, in Malaysia and Singapore, starting 1980. Uh, as soon as I graduate from I graduate from local U, uh, University of Malaya, then I oh, start UM, working. Okay. Yeah, UM. Uh, so I after that I work in the government uh, in the in a, uh, one government uh, drainage and education department as engineer uh, for 10 years. Then after that, I worked in the private sector. So altogether, I worked about 23 years in uh, Malaysia as an engineer. So, wow. yeah, so as uh, I was uh, I was introduced by Kat, I have experience in investing for 40 years. Uh, but uh, for the first 25 years, I just simply do. <laughs> I'm more of <laughs> speculating and gambling. Uh, I know nothing about uh, uh, investing, actually. Uh. I do read something, but I uh, you know, uh, don't really know much. So it's more of speculation. Uh, how, how, how did you really start then? Did, you know, did a friend or family member or someone talk to you about it? Or you, you found or you read something right at the start? Yeah. You see, when, uh, after working for 22 years in, uh, as, a, as an engineer in Malaysia, uh, uh, my friend asked me to migrate to <laughs> New Zealand. No? It is, it's a strange place, you know, because I, I was born and bred in Malaysia. Uh, in New Zealand, I don't even know where it's the capital. I thought Auckland is the capital. No? So, uh, but he keep on asking me to go to uh, uh, migrate to New Zealand. I, finally, I, I, I just uh, uh, went. Uh, uh, so, in uh, sometime in uh, 18 years ago, I went to New Zealand. That's more for, most of us are for migrating to either New Zealand, Austria, or overseas, it's more for children's education. Uh, so it was a good move, actually, for children's education. They got very good education, and some more is for free. <laughs> uh, wow. Uh, it's, uh, it's almost for free. Uh, because uh, I was thinking that if, uh, if we were to send our children, I got three children, if I were to send them overseas, that would cost me a lot of money. So uh, having them have the education here for free, it saved me a, that saved me a lot of money. So that is the motivation. Uh. And the, the, so, the, money, um, the money you can put into the stock market instead, is it? Uh, uh, not uh, not like that time. Uh, actually, I when I migrate, I, I have worked so many years. Especially in Singapore, I do I do uh, save quite a lot of money lah. Because you know, I I did went to quite high, high up in in the you know in the bank uh, as a, as a country manager. You know, and then the all expenses are paid for, car provided, everything. So I actually save a lot of money in working in Singapore. So with that money, I thought you know I can go to New Zealand. I would try to get a job. Uh, but if, even I can't, I couldn't get a job. I think with my saving, maybe I can still survive. Huh? So I went there, uh, I tried to get a job as engineer. I, I put up letters, you know, uh, hundreds of letters, but <laughs> none is successful. Only a couple of interviews, but, okay, okay. you know, hundreds of letters, uh, but only uh, two, I think two two letters uh, so for interview, but unsuccessful. Then I start working as a, a, a supervisor uh, for a couple of years. Okay. Mm. I didn't like it. So I thought, hey, yeah, here I got opportunity to study, you know. Uh, and I like, actually, I like finance. Although I'm an engineer, I like finance and investing. Yeah? So why do I study? So I went to university and I studied first study uh, uh, this uh, financial planning. And after that, I studied my master. Yeah. I was top in this master of finance, you know. Wow. <laughs> yeah, but, but having this qualification, uh, in having a degree in finance, investing doesn't mean that you're very good in investing. In fact, it can be a, a shortcoming, you know, because we are actually all brainwashed about efficient market hypothesis, you know, yeah. but that efficient yeah, yeah. market is that is efficient. Join then, you know, between, yeah. you know, theory and then, you know, practical, really, yeah, really theory, being theory, out there yeah, in the market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we are brainwashed. So we, we are brainwashed. That market is efficient. Uh, you, there's no no point in trying to, to you know, profit from the market until, unless you take extra risk. So all the time, you know, if, if, if efficient market, you know, so, didn't really benefit a lot uh, from the, the study. But I, I do learn something very useful, uh, but simple one is accounting, basic accounting. Uh, how to read financial statement, 
how to do valuation. Uh, those are very important, uh, but those are just small part of the curriculum. You know? uh, then, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I'm quite free, so I read a lot of books. Yeah? Uh, Auckland, uh, there are so many libraries. You know, you can go to libraries, you can so many books, all free, you know. So you go and read books. So I started reading books like, uh, you know, like Peter Lynch, uh, One Walk, One, One Up Wall Street, you know, uh, yeah. Pat Dorsey, yeah. you know, and, uh, and uh, many of these uh, uh, a good investor, like how they do investing. Uh. Actually, I learned all my value investing from all these people, from reading books rather than from my studies. Okay? Right, right. So, books, uh, can be, books can be tutors as well. And, you know, I, I see a lot of parallels as well. I did my yeah. degree as well. Uh, yeah. After that, I did my master's and it also had some portions in, in uh, finance as well, you know. So, yeah. like, you know, how to value companies, etc. And, yeah, I've, I've read, you know, a number of the books that, that you mentioned as well. So, yeah, definitely yeah. very helpful. Yeah, yeah, there, there are some very helpful. Yeah, you know. Then after reading the book, then I, I was still doing investing. Uh. Uh, initially, when I first started investing, I know more speculating gambler. I lost money, lost money. But at the time, not not a lot of money to lo lose, like, you know? <laughs> But later, <laughs> later I got uh, I got more money. I still investing, but I I am basically a, a quite a risk averse person, so I don't take a lot of risk. Uh, I don't later when I got money, I still invest, but I don't lose a lot of money, like, uh, Probably I make a little bit, or, or maybe lose a little bit, not much. Uh. But after I I embark on this journey of value investing after reading all these books, uh, I start doing that way. I find that I, it really works, you know. It really works. Uh. It is very it's a very logical thing, you know, value investing, you know, to buy uh, good company at cheap price. It's very, very uh, plausible uh, way of doing investing, you know. It should work. And of course it works, you know. But of course, nothing works all the time, you know. You cannot be working all the time working, uh. If, if that thing works all the time, the benefit will be arbitrage away, you know. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, that, that, that is important. Uh. Eventually, it will work. Uh. Uh, so that's how yeah, I, 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 I agree with that. You know, you don't need to win 100% of the, the time, actually. Just yeah, you know, yeah. above the average, betting average yeah. to win. question itself. So what inspired you, you know, to, to write this, you know? Complete value investing guide. That uh, works. I, I know it's not easy to write a book, so and it's this it's really thick. You know, it's really good value for money. So, what inspired yeah. you to, to write this book? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think some time ago when I started, I don't know how I discovered this uh, uh blog, uh, I Tree Investor. I, I couldn't remember how how I discovered. It. So I went there. You know, there are a lot of people talking about investing. In fact, a lot of arguments, <laughs> a, a lot of uh, uh, quarrel there, like, you know. But they, they, they are sure something to learn from. Like, eh? Then I started uh, started uh, uh, writing article, you know. And that time, uh, when I write article, hey, there are quite some people follow me, you know. There are a lot of people asking me, hey, this stock can buy, no, this stock, they got stock can buy, you know. So I, I, I go through quantitatively, eh, quantitatively, looking at the, uh, the metrics. Uh, oh, this one is good, that one is, uh, that one, no, uh, so I, I, I actually established myself uh, because, you know, it, it so happened that uh, maybe because of luck, uh, those questions they asked me, whether stock can buy, I said, can buy. Oh, a lot of the stocks are actually gone up a lot, you know. Uh, those stocks cannot buy, actually gone down, you know. <laughs> so, uh, probably due to luck. so I established myself there. You know, people, people know me. Uh. Then I start uh, this uh, uh, course, uh, online course. Uh. Also, somebody asked me, like, why don't you uh, start course, uh, teach course? Okay, I start. Eh, there are people who actually follow me, you know. So I got some, I don't earn a lot of money, like, you know, but it's my passion to do that. Uh. So I started course and then I, I have quite a number of students, uh, maybe uh, close to a thousand so far. Like, uh. Wow. So, then I, as I said, I wrote a lot of articles in I3. So actually it became natural. Uh. Actually, I got a lot of articles uh, in the, I wish I can compile, compile to do a book. But still, I'm lazy to do that. Like. Then somehow I got one student who actually uh, is an accountant of this, person called Hong Xi Ling, uh, Kou Ai, uh, Leng Yen, uh, Leng Yen uh. so uh, invite me for lunch, so after that you become friend, uh, uh, go, up and go, go for lunch, you know, at, the, at the, this one Utama, mm, and so talk he, about stocks, he said, right? yeah, he talked about <laughs> stocks, and I said, hey, hey Casey, why don't you write a book, uh? I said, no, la, no, 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 keep on encourage me, uh, that's how, he, how the encouragement from Co I eh, to start writing a book. Of course, the other guy is John Lim. Eh. John Lim attended my course before. Oh, okay. 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 So uh, I met with him. He said, Yeah, why don't you write a book? I think uh, I said, Okay, okay. Uh, and, and also, you know, because he is so supportive, uh, he 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 sponsored me to write a book. I don't have to come up with a single cent, you know. Uh, to, For those to who are wondering it. who John is, John is a publisher. 
Uh, yeah. So yeah, he's the publisher of uh, Casey's uh, book as well. That's why with the encouragement of Ko Ai and then John Lim, I started writing it. Like. It took me a long time. It took me a long time. How, how long Actually, did it take you know, from the... Well, I think, uh, at, least, decided, yeah. I think as, at least two years uh, from beginning until the end. Uh, uh, because, you know, a lot of changes and uh, the kind of things. Uh, so finally, I, I, I wrote the book. Uh, and uh, I thought... This book cannot sell, <laughs> you know. Uh, I don't mind subsidize in publishing it. Huh? Uh, for example, if I can, uh, I can publish, uh, I can print five hundred copies. In fact, I can, I can try to sell to my past course participants. Huh? Maybe useful to them because they know about what I am doing. Huh? What my principle, what my teaching. They probably know and because the book is quite, quite hard. Huh? You know, there's so many things inside the book. Huh? Or hard stuff. You know? Only maybe my online investment course participant will, will know. Uh, outside, because in outside, you know, the books are uh, to be able to sell, it must be simple, easy, mm. you know, right? Uh, easy to read, that's, simple that's the to trend, read. Yeah, simple, yeah, simple, yeah. easy to read. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's, that's how I come up with the book. Uh, and actually, I was surprised also because of the help of John Lim. Uh, John Lim, he was very good. He go and uh, actually do some uh, publicity for me. Yeah? So he mm. get the uh, age magazine to interview me. Well, that was good, you know, that guy, uh, very, very good, he interviewed me and then, you know, he published uh, uh, and then I, a lot of people knows me, uh, a lot of people knows me and then uh, uh, also because of MCO, a lot of people are, are locked down so, <laughs> so they, they they can do some reading you know, and they order the book to me, a lot of them order the book to me uh, uh, at the time I, 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 you know, those order from me, I can get autograph, you know, some, some people are wow. happy with that, uh, mm-hmm. but you can order from MPH or, or my publisher, Ace Premium. So that's how I, I, I publish a book. Yeah. Interesting. So were there any like surprises or key challenges faced while you were researching and writing this book? Uh, as, I, as I say, uh, I actually I have, a, a lot, have written a lot of articles in uh, public forum. And also in my course, uh, I have a lot of course material. So it's a matter of mm-hmm. compilation and updating. Mm-hmm. Uh, that part, not too difficult, except that I have to go through again and again. A lot of time spent on it, you know. Uh, so basically, not that much of uh, challenges, uh, as I said. Most of that, most of the materials are there. So the I guess the hardest part is actually to pick and choose what you want to squeeze into that one book, right? Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I I written four hundred word articles. Uh, there are a lot of things, but a lot of repetitive uh, The article a lot of repetitive because value investing. Uh, there's just so much. Uh, yeah, not not to say you know everything is new. Uh, it's very. It's it's not a very white thing like you know it's quite a narrow kind of thing yeah uh, buying good company at, at good price and what is good company what a cheap price basically that is it like, how to look at the business mm-hmm. uh, the mood of the business uh, uh, that's a good thing. segue as well so you know yeah. maybe we can move in a little bit uh something into more, that as well yeah, yeah. so more you know <laughs> yeah uh, what what is value <laughs> investing you know uh, if you ask 10 people you know they, they may have different definitions mm. as well you know how would you how would you kc define what is value investing Actually, uh, there are a lot of misconceptions about value investing. You know? You'll be surprised some people think that value investing is buying cheap stock, penny stock. Huh? <laughs> that, that is not a surprise. You know? uh, but most people have the misconception, misconceptions about value investing. They think value investing is just buy cheap in terms of price to book and price to earning or high dividend yield that is considered cheap. But actually, uh, Value investing, like you say, like, yeah, it, it means different things to different different people. I know a lot of growth investors uh, investing in high growth technology technology stock. They consider themselves value investing because basically value investing is, you know, you buy buy something at a price with the value much higher than that. Huh? That value can be present value, or it can be future value, right? A high growth stock, the value comes from the future. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, value stock, uh, most of the value come from present, present or the next couple of years. But gold stock is for uh, way in the future. Uh. So basically, so value investing actually is like, what is value? Value, uh, we use intrinsic value. Intrinsic value is uh, actually uh, 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 all the cash flow uh, in the future uh, is counted back to the present. And what is the value? Uh, that is the value. So it can be gold stock where the value you did. Uh, in the future, it is come back to the present, or it can be uh, uh, a value stock uh, with the present value. You know? 
Oh. That's, that's, that's true as well. And yeah, thanks mm. for clearing up that misconception. There are people who think that, oh, uh, value investing is about, you know, stocks that are like, you know, uh, 20, 30 years old. It excludes all the tech stocks and all that. But yeah, mm. those are all definitely misconceptions. Yeah, yeah. Some some people think that value investing just buy those, uh, those uh, blue chip lunch. No, that's not value investing. That is really not value investing. Huh? There are also some who think that value investing is dead. <laughs> so does yeah. this still work in uh, today's uh, growth focused market? All right, and feel free to share. So I know Casey you have some slides. So yeah, if you yeah. uh, want to go through that. Yeah, before that, uh, before the slides, mm -hmm. uh, value investing is value investing dead. I I just happened to Google today. Uh, what they are. There are scores of articles about uh, value investing is dead, dead. It's value investing dead. Uh, I mean, my 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 short answer is no. Uh, no with the exclamation mark. Uh, <laughs> a few exclamation uh, marks, right? <laughs> yeah, with the exclamation mark. Because uh, I am a value investor. I call myself a value investor. For the past 15 years, when I start value investing until now, I'm doing quite reasonably well. Uh, reasonably well. Of course, during these few years, uh, yeah, there is a little bit up and down. Like in 2008, there's something uh, down, and then maybe 2014, a little bit down, and then uh, uh, 2018 also was uh, down. Quite The market was quite down. But if you look at the, the long term from 15 years ago now, my own experience, uh, and also you can see my uh, uh, portfolio, which I published in i3, uh, they are all value investing uh, uh, portfolio uh, based on different value investing strategy. Uh. They are all doing well in fact they did very well in the first five years okay very very well huh? of course in 2018 you know throughout but still over long term still still very good huh? so my own experience said is not huh? but a lot of people you know what this 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 statement about value investing is big, huh? is i think uh, mostly from the media you know huh? and from some some funds you know they, they're based on this uh, value strategy huh? and the strategy you know when they talk about value strategy it's based on some value factor huh? like, mm. like so is, is, low, it like low price news? is it like fake news or you know are people trying to manipulate this uh this uh like no, no. An agenda to say that no no it's not fake news actually if you base on uh, uh those value factors are uh, p ratio low p ratio or low price of book ratio and high division that like high dividend yield ratio the past 10 years actually this you based on this strategy actually uh, is very underperformed uh stock uh, that, that is true but as i said value investing is not that that may be part of it uh, that may be part of the value investing uh. in fact in the in 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 in, in the past uh, even this value factor like just based on price earning ratio or price to book ratio they have been doing well okay even over long term until now they still outperform the growth stock but the last 10 years it really it did underperform uh. in fact whether you grow investing value investing during different period they, they, they you know they, they perform differently uh, up and down up and down uh, but basically i i as i say value investing is not just that uh, I, I i will share with you what is value investing in my context in my in my slides all right awesome yeah uh, looking forward to that definitely yeah now that this is my book uh, value investing guide that work uh now this is a very a uh, comprehensive book. Uh, it covers almost everything about uh, fundamental investing. Fundamental investing. I'm talking about when you invest based on you are you are have treating investing in a stock as akin to investing in the business. Uh, that's fundamental investing. So this book is very comprehensive. It covers uh, almost everything about fundamental investing. It even cover like Steve mentioned. It even covers some personal finance. You know. I started with uh, you know, advice to a 25-year-old, huh? 24-year-old uh, man, what should they do? And then there's this, I have uh, also discussed about option, different options of investing. I'll talk about the history of the stock market in Malaysia. Uh, i talk about uh, asset allocation, diversification, risk management, that kind of thing. Before I jump into uh, the hard stuff, huh? that is a financial statement, how to read annual report, how to read, analyze, and interpret financial statement and how to do valuation. Uh. Even like valuation, I talk about so many kind of valuation, including discount cash flow analysis, uh, this kind of thing. So a very, very comprehensive book. Uh. And this book, you can get it from uh, MPH, or uh, popular. I think it's still selling there. Uh, that is my publisher, uh, Ace Premier. You can get it from there, uh, acepremier.com. 
or you you prefer an autograph copy for me, you can uh, get it for me uh, to this uh, CKC book order at gmail.com. And that is my Facebook uh, page, uh, uh, KC Chong NZ. Yeah? KC Chong NZ, my Facebook page. You are welcome to visit it because I, I do write regular uh, articles uh, to share in the page. Yeah. Okay, before I talk about what is value investing, let's talk about what is not value investing. Yeah? It's, 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 uh, it's important to understand what is va not value investing. Yeah? Rumors, recent rumors, um, a lot of rumors in the stock market. Stock tips, a lot of stock tips, free stock tips. Hot tips, uh, hot tips. Uh, hot tips. Uh. <laughs> so you, you know uh, why people give you hot tips? Uh? Why people want to make you rich? Uh? So, of course, hypes, uh, you know, hypes, uh, people you know, keep on promoting the share, how good it is every day, you know, write about it, uh, encourage you to buy. You, you have to wonder you know, why, why people, you know, uh, uh, try to give you tips and rumors, that kind of thing. The other thing, what is not very interesting is day trading. Uh? You know, with uh, this MCO, uh, you know, a lot of there are a lot of new uh, uh, investor uh, investor in the market. Uh, they hope to make money. They have a lot of time. They hope to make money in the stock market by doing day trading. That means they buy and sell the stock within the day. Actually, very easy money, isn't it? You buy in the morning. You know, you make one cent, two cent, and you sell off. You make a, a, a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars. Very good. Okay. Okay. Very good. Uh, so a lot of people do that and a lot of people make money, a few hundred dollars, a few thousand dollars every day. But the time will come when they buy, when they buy the stock and the stock didn't go up. Uh, and suddenly, there are also cases that the stock just suddenly, suddenly uh, limit down. Uh, and day trading become investing for long term. Uh, many of them. Uh, why do I say that? You know, they are actually, if you look at statistics, uh, all this listen to rumors, stock tips, all, all the retail investors, uh, 90% of them lose money. Only 10% lose win money, win in the stock market. That is a plural of uh, dabbling in the stock market. All these are speculation. Yeah? That's, that's so true as well. Mm. You know, uh, retail participation is an all-time high during the uh, MCO, CMCO period. And mm. and yeah, there's that false sense of confidence, right? You, you do a few and you make a little bit of money and suddenly you mm. think, you know, you're a, a genius at, at, at you know, mm. trading. Yep. Yeah, I have a group, uh, my, my former classmate, an uh, engineering, engineering classmate in MU, uh, we have a group, you know, a couple of months ago, there are a lot of talking about trading, how, how they make money, oh, they buy this and then they make so much money. Uh. Now keep quiet already, now quiet already, you know. Uh, that time they talk about glove, you know, they make, wow, oh, they make, buy and then they make a few thousand dollars on a day, you know. But you know that uh, after that, uh, glove actually went downtrend, uh, a lot of them are get caught, you know. Few people make money, uh. they are, they are people who make uh, money in day trading or uh, or any any way of investing, but very few. You, under, you must understand that this all these are speculation, and speculation is zero sum game. They are winners and they are losers, and you have to know. You must know, like what Warren Buffett said, you must know who the Patsy is. Nah? You don't know, then you are the Patsy, because in the stock market there are so many players. The big timers are the institutional investors, the the fund manager. Those rich investors who got a lot of money who can manipulate the market. Now, once the share go up, it will go up. Once it go down, it will go down. So, you if you are against them, whom do you think will win, and who do you think you win? Do lose? There's no price for getting the right answer. We must think of investing uh, as not a zero sum game, but everybody gain. Uh. So you must think of it investing in a stock as investing in a business. Uh, the business grow. Everybody make money. Uh. So investing in business. What, what is investing in business? Invest in the people, in the company, the plant machinery they have, the products and services they have, uh, the customers they have, the supplies they have. Uh, that is investing, investing in the business. I, I totally agree with you, KC, because yeah, definitely a lot of times people forget when you know you're not investing just in you know, a piece of paper or just numbers on the screen. There is actually an underlying business that's that's behind it. So thank you so much for that reminder. Yeah, exactly, Steve. You're right. Let's hear what the grandmaster of value investing says. I hope you know who's a grandmaster. That's Benjamin Graham. So Benjamin Graham said investing is most intelligent when it is most business-like. So you must treat investing as Investing a business, you must know the business, how the business make money, right? Is it making good money? And, and lastly, but not the least, 
Is it a fair price to buy? That is investing. That is value investing. So what is value investing? In my context, uh, PE, low PE, low price to book, high dividend yield, they are also value investing uh, because you buy cheap things, right? But that is only part of the story. Uh. In my context, value investing is to buy quality company at a good value. What do you consider a good quality company? A company has a high return of capital. It's whether either a high return of equity or high return of invested capital or high return of total capital, uh, but high return of capital. Is do you look at all, all three of those uh, measurements or does it depend on the type of company that you're looking at? I look at all, all of them, three of them. All right, uh, yeah. Of course, number one is return of capital. Uh, uh, a company must earn high return of capital at least higher than the cost of cost, cost of capital. Uh, capital of capital has a cost. Uh, so if your return is less than your cost, then it's a value destroyer. Uh, uh, you, you lose money. Next thing is cash flow. Return actually is uh, earnings. Uh, earnings, But very often, uh, earnings are not translated to cash. You know? uh, a lot of earnings, you know, especially like you know, those construction companies, uh, they have a lot of earnings. There could be a lot of earnings. Uh, but earnings is what people owe you or what you think people owe you. Uh, but, pe but the client don't pay you in cash, you see. So cash flow is important. The earnings must be translated in cash flow. Of course, the third one also very important is the growth. So three things, high return of capital, followed by cash flow, and the company man's growth potential. So you look at these three things, uh, if you tie them together, I, I, I call them the three musketeers. You earn high return with money, you reinvest your capital because of high growth, it compound, it make a lot more return, more cash flow, reinvest, earn more and more and more. The most important, the three, three things are uh, imp important in the uh, in uh, investing. Uh. So what are those uh, characteristics of uh, uh, those uh, high quality company? Fast moving product, well-known brands. Uh, people keep on buying and, and uh, consuming. Yeah, Carlsberg, you know, I, I am a golfer. I got this golfer group on Saturday when I was back in Malaysia. After the golf, we go to the terrace drink. And after that, we go for dinner, dinner drink. After that, they all went, they all, they all go to the pub, they drink. Uh. Who? And you, you go to coffee shop, uh, you, you, you will see a lot of these tables, you know, with full of these uh, bottles, empty bottles, uh, very fast moving products. Nestle, you know, Maggie Me, uh, Nescafe, everybody consume every day. Uh. So all these, these products, they have very high return of capital, very excellent cash flow. Then products. So this qualitative characteristic you're talking about would be brands that uh, you recognize or you use. Is that how you define that? Yeah, it is part of it, lah. Part of it, uh, uh, When we define quality company, okay, we have uh, other uh, quality companies of products and services that always are purchased, uh, like uh, glove uh, in uh, in food handling, in uh, in uh, healthcare, is always purchased. Drugs, uh, medicine, standard and poor. This this uh, this uh, uh, what do you call it? Bond rating company. Rating uh, agencies, uh, yeah. Rating agencies. You need to. To issue bond, then you're going to go to rating agency to, to give you the rating. Yeah? Uh, and and uh, you know, the bond market is much bigger than equity market you know, in the world. Like this uh, big four, uh, you, if you have company, you need to submit your uh, financial uh, account, you need them. So these are products that are always uh, purchased by people. Then, next quality tip, uh, characteristic premium products. Those are like long jean, very high, high end. Uh. My watch, my citizen watch is near a few hundred dollars. Long jean might cost, cost you tens of thousands. Uh. Tiffany, uh, this jewelry, uh, you know, uh, with a nice packaging will cost you a few thousand dollars more. Hermes, Hermes, uh, remember the Belkin, uh, the, the bags, uh, the bags. These uh, products are very high margin, with a high return of capital. And products of services, high scalability. Netflix, uh, you know, once they have de uh, uh, developed the, 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 the firms, you know, so any new uh, customer just add to the bottom line. I use uh, Microsoft product every day. Eh, once the product has been uh, established, you just need to get, get customers. So every, every customer they get, the, the revenue goes to the bottom line. 
what is high scalability? Software developer, Tencent. It appears most of the scalable companies are all more uh, tech related or in the tech technology sector. Yeah, generally yes, yes, yes. Uh, because the marginal cost uh, is very low. Uh, additional customer doesn't cost them anything, right? For technical technology company. So the marginal profit equal to the marginal revenue, high scalability. Then network effect, more people use Google, the more people use, the more the more people will use. Facebook, uh, I started to really use Facebook uh, only a few months ago and I, I use it, I do it every day now. So I get connected to so many people. Uh, so there's a network effect. More people use and more, more will use. Same thing, you sell things in Amazon because there are a lot of buyers. So you as a seller, you want to go to a place where there are sellers. You know? uh, so when you go sellers, more buyers will go. Uh, it's a network effect. Alibaba, uh, B2B, B2C, C2C, uh, more people use it. So the more people use, the more valuable. Then the other thing, uh, uh, characteristic of quality companies, low price with a name. Uh, low, I call it low price plus by name, like Walmart. Uh, they sell every, every, every city in the US, they have Walmart and they sell cheap things. Uh, they have bargaining power because they, sell, they are buying so many things, very high return of capital, uh, home depot, all this very high asset turnover. So very fast cash converted, uh, cash conversion cycle. So that will give them very high ROC. So these are all the- Maybe You wanna the define the quality. cash conversion cycle briefly for those who are new to the term? Cash conversion cycle is the, you know, you, you when you produce something, you're gonna buy, Somebody order something from you, you you go and order the material, you 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 make it, okay? Then after that, you sell it, sell it to your customers with credit. Then after that, your customer pay you, and then you also pay your pay uh, pay your uh, debtors, uh, the suppliers. So the time from the time you start ordering your materials to do the thing until you get the money, uh, so that is a cash conversion conversion cycle. How many days it take you from starting to, you know, buy the inventory to collect money from your customer? That is the cash conversion cycle in terms of days. Okay, I just talked about that, the quality aspect uh, of uh, value investing. Is there any question before I talk about valuation? Because a company can be high quality company. But if they're selling very high price, uh, you will still make money, la, but you you won't make a lot of money. La. But if you're able to buy at a fair price, best still, if you can buy at a cheap price, then you will make a lot more money. Is it like saying that, you know, the profits are in a way already made when you actually buy the company or buy the stock at a particular price? No, there's no guarantee that you buy the, even you buy a, uh, good companies, uh, there's no guarantee you'll make money. Uh. You only make money when uh, only after you, you sell them. What I'm trying to say is that when you buy the companies, you must be able to estimate what is the value. Then you know what price to pay. Uh. So eventually, because you pay a low price, when, the, the, when people realize the value of the stock and the share price go up, then you make money uh, by selling. And now is the, the value part of it. Uh. How much should we pay for it? There are some simple valuations, uh, uh, things like PE ratio. I think most people will know it. Uh, it's a very, it's a very common valuation metric. Uh, that is PE ratio, share price divided by the earning per share. They give you a PE ratio. Uh. Some people say that you know if PE ratio is below ten, then it's a good buy. But PE ratio depend, uh, depend on industry, depend, depend on the, the type of business. So. Uh, but generally, if P ratio is 10, it's, it's good. Uh, uh, but for some uh, high group company, P ratio 30 doesn't mean that, mean that it's, it's expensive. Uh. Then mm, but next but one. That ceiling, you know, is there like a maximum ceiling that, you know, no matter what industry they say, if the P ratio is above, say, I don't know, 40 or 50, that's something you'll, you'll say, oh, I'll never touch that because that's way overvalued? Whether a P ratio is high or not, it, it, one of the very important things, it depends on the growth. Uh, what is the expected growth of the company? Uh, if the growth of the company, like, you know, things like we talk about years ago, Amazon is growing at maybe 80% a year, 100% a year, even the P ratio at 100 is still not expensive, is it? Uh, because as, as the company grow, the revenue earning grow, uh, I mean, obviously the, the share price will grow, right? it will grow. 
not not really a ceiling, uh, but of course, if the PE ratio become a few hundred, uh, no matter how high the growth also, you know, it, it, it's difficult. Uh. You know, PE ratio, uh, the, some people interpret PE ratio as the number of years to get back your investment. Uh. So if the PE ratio is 100, uh, it means that you take 100 years to get back your, recoup your investment. But that is whether that the company doesn't grow. Uh. If the company go also grow 100, 100%, uh, then, you know, very fast earning will, will grow, overgrow the price, you see? Not really a ceiling, but as I say, not too high. La. Not, not, uh, I mean, for like traditional business, uh, okay, I'll give you an example like bank, uh, bank business, uh, where there's very limited growth. Uh. If the P ratio is more than uh, 20, I think it's very expensive already. Right? Mm. Whereas for a company like, okay, like Tencent, where it, although it's a big company now, it's still a potential, it's still growing at 30%, 40% a year. P ratio of 30, it's nothing. Huh? It's still very fair, very reasonable. Huh? Mm, yeah, yeah, definitely shouldn't be just looking P ratio just in isolation, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. What other valuations then do, do will we be looking at? Yeah, the next one is price of book, lah. It's also a common uh, uh, valuation metric. Uh, but I don't use it that often already because uh, a lot of uh, business, uh, we actually look at the earnings uh, there is a is an earning potential which drive the share price rather than the book value I, 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 but i just mentioned about bank uh, except for banks uh, banks and financial institutions a uh, price to book is very important because uh, banks the the asset and liabilities are uh, marked to market uh, they have a market value so the price to book is uh, is a very good uh, valuation uh, metric for bank other than that you know there are a lot of uh, like those tech company they are very light asset a lot of assets are not captured, you know, like uh, like those tech company or like asset company, they have a lot of assets in terms of intangible assets, you see, like the people they have, the brand they have, you know, the kind of things are not captured. Uh, so I... I does it, does I, it make it even more challenging then for like, uh, especially if you're investing in Malaysia, where there isn't any metric actually for all this intangible, at least overseas, you know, you would get uh, at least a valuation of, let's say, the brand value, etc. But you don't get that say, in, uh, in Bursa, Malaysia, for, for example? Does it make it more challenging? Yeah, you see, take an take example, like the technical technology companies uh, in Malaysia, I think many of them, are, uh, the P ratio are quite high. La. They are uh, like P of 50, 60. Uh. Unlike US companies, uh, where they still have a lot of uh, growth potential, Malaysia is a small economy. Uh, that the growth potential is not there. La. Then I would think it's quite high la, in terms of uh, valuation. Uh, in terms of uh, P ratio of 60, 70 for those uh, tech company. I think they are quite a lot of them, uh, quite high. Uh, but that is an in thing. Uh, a lot of people are chasing these technology companies. Uh, but I, I think it's quite a bit a bit high for those Malaysian companies. Yeah. Thanks for sharing your input on that. Next one, price to cash flow. The other one is dividend yield. Uh, dividend yield used to be a very uh, uh, favorite uh, investing strategy. Uh, they tend to buy high dividend yield uh, company. One reason is that only company making profit can afford to pay dividend. You know? Some some companies say they make a lot of profit, but they don't pay dividend. They don't really know whether they're actually making money. You know, you know the earning actually is uh, real or not. You know? But if the company pay dividend, we know that company actually making dividend. So dividend has been a good uh, uh, investing strategy, especially now at this low interest regime. Uh, when you put your money into bank, uh, where you earn what less than two percent interest, if you get a dividend stock, uh, like like Maybank, you get four point five percent dividend yield. Uh, maybe it's a good, good, uh, uh, good investment. Uh. So especially retirees, uh, they want regular income. They will look for it. But bear in mind, uh, when you look, when you go for dividend yield, high dividend yield, you must make sure that the dividend is sustainable. That's true. So as well. On the risk free rate, definitely above the rates as well. But how about for you know? Uh, there are some thoughts that you know. Uh, if you're investing, let's say, overseas, for example, in the States, and, you know, uh, dividend is actually taxed when you get the dividends uh, declared, actually, there's a 30% dividend tax. So in that case, wouldn't it be better to invest in stocks that, uh, especially overseas, for example, in the States, that don't actually declare dividends? Yes, I fully agree with you, Steve. Yes. In in US, uh, when a company makes money, it's taxed at a company level. When the company declare dividend, uh, when you go to... Uh, individual investor, individual investor have to declare income tax again. So there's double tax. So it's, it's not, in fact, high dividend yield is not very good uh, for US companies. Uh. 
because of this tax. Uh, a lot of tax. R- rather than you know, you get the dividend. You know, the company reinvest in back the company in, into the company and uh, make more profit. And then uh, there is a capital appreciation of, of the share that is better. Yeah, you are right, uh, Steve. I fully really agree with you. Mm-hmm. On on that tangent as well, how about for companies that are buying back their own shares? Would that be part of the valuation that you look at as well? Buying back shares, uh, if the company got a lot of excess cash, uh, you know, Apple recently, uh, they bought back a lot of shares uh, because they have a lot of cash, you know. Uh, you know, buying back shares, it's just like it's just like a dividend, uh, you know, it, it given back to shareholders because once uh, they buy back share, they less outstanding share in the market, the uh, earning per share will be higher. So it's another way of giving back to, to shareholder. Some companies, they buy back share, you know, just to support the share price, uh, even though the share price may not be cheap. Uh, that is not good. Uh, but if the company buy back share because the, the share price is way undervalued, that, that is good. That is good. Uh. So it all depends. Uh, it all depends. I, I would leave it to the management because I think I recently, like everybody knows, Top Love uh, bought back a lot of shares. A lot of buybacks, that's right. Yeah, yeah there, there are a lot of criticisms on that. Uh. Very hard to say uh, you know, uh, whether Top Love at this price in view of the vaccine or thing, is it is it really still undervalued? But that's what management thinks so. Uh, I, I, I believe they know better than me. Uh, uh, hopefully, hopefully, there is also this valuation from the whole firm level because some firm, they may have a lot of uh, borrowing. Uh, uh, so if you use uh, P ratio, sometimes you can distort, uh, distort the real picture uh, because the firm may have a lot of borrowing or some firms, they may have a lot of cash. The cash vision not actually needed for the operation. So I also uh, uh, use this uh, valuation from the firm uh, anchor point of view uh, using enterprise value. Uh, uh, it's the whole enterprise rather than just from the equity point of view. Uh, I don't want to go uh, in detail because uh, that will take some time. So the multiple use for using enterprise value, you have enterprise value uh, divided by the EBITDA, earning before interest tax and uh, deposition and amortization, uh, or EBIT multiple and uh, enterprise divided by EBIT, no pet, no pet, it's just EBIT after tax. Eh? Or, or you use uh, enterprise, how many times enterprise over the sales. Eh? So this is the valuation on the firm's level, the whole firm level. Of course, the other thing is uh, I talk about intrinsic value. Right? Intrinsic value is uh, what is the value? Is it all those I talked about before that uh, are relative, uh, relative uh, valuation met- met- method uh, uh, in compare with the market, compare with the peers. Yeah? But uh, actually, the share, uh, uh, as we mentioned before, the value of the share is depend on the discount cash flow of all the future cash flow. What is the value of that? Future cash flow. Uh, that is using discount cash flow. Uh, you, uh, I won't go into that. So you get the, in, from that, you get the intrinsic value of the share. Uh, uh, generally, intrinsic value goes up, uh, goes up, uh, is uh, going up slowly. But the share price, different share price fluctuates. Uh, you can fluctuate up and down, up and down, up and down. So if you know the intrinsic value of a, of a stock, when the pay, share price is below it, then you buy, isn't it? You buy a cheaper price and the value. Uh, that is value investing, yes. right? In value investing, we have this call something called margin of safety. We want to buy uh, a certain amount below the intrinsic value, twenty percent, thirty percent below it. Uh. If it below that, then we buy. Uh. So we buy it at a margin of safety. So, so even though even though we may be wrong in estimation in estimation of intrinsic value, yeah, you can always always be wrong, you know, because it's it's very subjective intrinsic value, uh, because Intrinsic value uh, in what future cash flow is a is a, a forecast. Huh? So often that you are wrong. So because of that, you want to have a, a margin of safety. You buy way below it. Of course, when the share price go up, the intrinsic value, then you you sell out. You 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 get out and you make your profit yourself. So that is a uh, intrinsic value of valuation. Is a uh, discounted cash flow the best model in determining intrinsic value? Actually, when you talk about intrinsic, determine intrinsic value of stock, uh, that is the only way. Uh, that is the only way to determine the intrinsic value. What is the actual value? Uh, the other things, the other uh, valuation, they are relative valuation. They are not 
basing on intrinsic value. They are just basing on relative values, what the market uh, uh, price them uh, in relative to others. Intrinsic value, they are flaws. Uh, it, it, it's not a, I wouldn't say it's the best method of, uh, of uh, looking at, at the price versus value. Uh, because a, lot, a lot of people don't even use it because, because of the uncertainties in forecasting of the future cash flow. Uh, a lot of very very good investors, super investors, they some of them they say that this is actually nonsense. You see? But I I think it's uh, useful uh, you know? Although the value I get it varies quite a quite a wide margin, but at least I have an estimate an, an estimate value of it. Huh? Then only with the estimated value, then I can decide what price to buy, isn't it? Isn't it? Without a value, I don't I don't really know what 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 should I pay. True, true, not perfect, yeah. but yeah, that definitely helps as well. Another yeah. point you raised as well, Casey, was you know you mentioned uh selling as well. You know when when the price goes up to a certain point, you know is there a rule of thumb that they use, or you know how do you go about that for uh, disposing or exiting a uh, uh, position that you're holding? If you look at, read, read my book uh, on when to sell, uh, I have an uh, article on that. Uh, when to sell, uh, generally if the share price has gone up to intrinsic value, we sell, uh, right? Because it's already above the value we sell to get profit, to profit. Sometimes we, we you know, we are just individual investor uh, doing our own analysis. Even professional analysts, uh, they can be wrong. Uh, no? With the share price keep on going up, uh, uh, you, you might wonder, you know, is my intrinsic value estimation right or not? You know? So sometimes if my uh, the share price gone up beyond my intrinsic value, I still hold it uh, unless it's gone up to a certain, certain amount. Uh, uh, for me, there's a margin of safety of selling also. Uh. If the in this, if the share price gone up, say, 20% above my intrinsic value, uh, estimated intrinsic value, uh, then I sell. But before that, I might just keep it because I, I could be wrong in my estimation also. You know? Why the share price keep on, keep on going up? There must be something I don't know, isn't it? Right? Mm -hmm. Although if you say the investor was trying to play it safe and it's got already gone up, say, you know, at or above the intrinsic value, but instead of selling all, they dispose maybe just part of it, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. Good, good point. Excellent point, Steve. Yeah, excellent point. Uh, maybe just slowly dis dispose part of it and uh, get some off the tables. And next, you you were wanting to share with us uh, as well, right? About uh, coal size, uh, yardstick of uh, value investing. I know coal quite well. Uh, as I said, we sometimes have lunch together. Uh, long ago, coal the yardstick, uh, is slightly different from now. Uh. No, now I'm talking about coal yardstick now, uh, not the previous one. Uh. He emphasizes growth a lot. Uh, he in fact said, no growth, no buy. Must be growth. Which is logical, uh, you know. It's only you buy growth stock, then the share price will go up, then you make more money, isn't it? Uh, if no growth, it's just like you're putting your bank, uh, putting your money in, uh, in FD, you, know, you earn the same. You know? But whereas it's a high growth, uh, then you, you make a lot more money. The, when the earning revenue earning grow, the share price will go up. You make mm, mm, more that's money. True, that's true. That's yeah, true. Definitely. Yeah. So for him, uh, number one, that stake is growth, right? But bear in mind, you know, growth uh, is a future expectation. You know, we don't make money from past growth. You know, we are making money from the future growth. The future growth is full of uncertainties. Yeah, you must be very good, uh, Very good in uh, estimating future growth. The next important thing we talk about is return of equity. Previously, I talk about return of capital. Capital can be equity uh, or invested capital, whatever. And he emphasized on return of equity. Eh? Uh, for him, he, he wants simplicity because it, return of equity is much easier to, to understand and to extract out. Return is net profit. It's from it's the income statement there. Isn't it? Every income statement got a net profit, net income or, or net profit. Yeah, Equity, you look at the balance sheet. Uh, you have the equity attributed to common shareholder. It's all there, you know. So you just take this number, the earning number divided by equity number, you get return equity. Of course, you need to you want to have a high return of equity. You have so much equity in the in the in your company. If you earn two percent, what for? Might as well liquidate it and then give me back my, the, the equity so that I can invest in other things. You know, I earn 10%, 15%. You know? So you must have high return of equity, higher than what the required return from the equity shareholder. If you invest in this company with a uh, aim of getting 12%, the return of equity must be higher than higher than that. Uh, otherwise, I, I will take the money and uh, I will get the management, liquidate the company, give me the money, and then I invest in other things. Isn't it? Then he talked about cash flow. These three are what I call uh, quality metrics. Uh. 
uh, to gauge the quality of the company. So, as I mentioned before, return is accounting number. It must be translated to actual cash. Does a company actually get the cash from their earning rather than just accountant earning, uh, accounting earning? So, these are the three things. But he didn't mention about how much, uh, but for me, like cash flow from operations, uh, the important cash flow segment I look at is in, uh, cash flow from operating activities. Uh, it must be at least equal to your net earning or more. Because cash flow, you have a uh, you know, depreciation which is add back to the cash flow statement. That's right. So yeah. it, should, it should be more than earning. But of course, a growing company will need uh, a lot of cash as well. Like, you know, a growing company needs a lot of cash for, for working capital, increase in working capital, in capex. Uh. So sometimes a growing company may not have good, good uh, I'm talking a different cash flow on operation, it must be good. But there is this thing called free cash flow. Uh, that is, free cash flow is cash flow from operation. Then after you spend, spend money for capital expenses, after that, you get free cash flow. Uh, this, is, this free cash flow is where the company can use it to dispute what as dividend, share buyback, or reduce the debt, or go and do other investment. Uh. So that is free cash flow. A growing company, I mean, for ordinary company, I would like to have good cash flow from operation, which is equal or more than uh, net profit, right? But I also want to have free cash flow uh, for ordinary company uh, uh, so that, you know, that you can give me some dividend or you can invest in other things to make money, more money for me. But for growing company, because the need for uh, additional working capital and especially for additional capital expenses, uh, you may have negative free cash flow. That is all right. That is all right for high growth company. For high good company, very important now uh, you must have high return of capital. Otherwise, you will be uh, that kind of growth will be value destroying. Okay. So these three things, quality metrics, uh, uh, for go I important for him. Valuation, he look at PE. Uh, PE ratio must be less than 10 or whatever. Uh. Also, PE ratio, as I mentioned before, very easy. Uh. The price, you can look from the you know your price, what is the price, everyday price, earning. Earnings, earning per share, very easy. Yeah, uh? either from uh, you know from financial statement. You, know, you look at the trailing twelve month. What is the earning per share? Then you get a price. Very easy. Uh? Yeah, uh, yeah, very easily available information. Yeah, very easily available. Uh, then the other thing, dividend yield. Uh, as I mentioned before, a company only make, if they only make money, uh, then they can keep dividend yield. yield dividends. Yeah? So that is uh, assurance to shareholder that they 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 have. Uh, something back, you know? and this dividend yield, they can compare with alternative investment, like putting bank deposit, you know, if I get dividend yield of 5% from a company, very, very good, you know, it's more than twice I can get from, from a fixed deposit, you see. So these are the five things about COI, five yard stick. Uh. This is a, a quality metric for the first three and value value metric on the first three. These are very good because it's very, it's simple to use, very simple to use. And it cover everything. Why it cover everything? You must have high return of equity. Huh? You growth, no point. You must have high return of capital. Return of equity. You must have cash flow. You, you say you make a lot of money, a very high return of capital. Where is your money? Where is your cash? Ah, you show in the cash flow. It's a cover. It cover everything. Yeah, that is cold eyes, five yeah, stick. Yeah. So now, what is your next book or projects that you are currently working on? Or maybe there's something that you are secretly working uh, on that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Katrina, as I said mm. before, I'm not a kind of material to write book. <laughs> I, Just being humble. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, when I wrote my first book, there are so many mistakes. Uh, so many mistakes. Uh, uh, so after I published my book, actually, the, surprisingly, uh, they are quite good feedback uh, from my readers. Uh, the feedback. Uh, and... Those people who bought the book from me, uh, I uh, promise to answer any question they have. Uh, to, so I answer the questions. Uh, so from the question they, they asked me, uh, I find that oh, maybe I can write a lot of things. You know? So now I have this book called Lessons Learned from Investing. Lessons uh, Learned from Investing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, because Is that already you, published and uh, available? Nah, no, not yet. Not yet. Uh, it's, it's, okay. It's coming soon. Coming soon. <laughs> yeah, coming soon. Uh, I think I quite got some good lessons. Uh, uh, maybe next time you should buy my book. Uh, lesson learned. 
to investing. Definitely, uh, keep us yeah, posted yeah. on it. Yeah, we'll be happy to yeah review yeah, and, and, but, and share on the book yeah. as well. And now that you've gone through the uh, the process, and then definitely like you know, you call it a success for for the book that you have written, and then now working on a second book. So, what would you be your uh, your advice for any aspiring authors? Yeah, uh, my advice. Uh, yeah, I think you follow your passion. Uh. I like me. I had a passion for investing, finance investing, investing. Uh, so for me. It's a passion to write the book, so you follow passion. If you you not you like you like something, you are good in something. Follow a passion, write it, just do it, just act on it. Don't 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 procrastinate. Uh, don't be perfection. Uh. don't think I ah, no, no good, no good. Don't, don't worry about it. Uh. Uh, just just do it. Uh. But don't expect good reward uh, from writing book. But uh, get do 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 some uh, publicity. Uh. I noticed that. Uh, the publicity from the Age magazine uh, who interviewed me a couple of times, uh, it helps a lot. And then there are some bloggers uh, to the to this uh, introduction by John Lim. Uh, some bloggers uh, asked me for for webinar uh, for bit publicity. Uh, then more people know about you. Then more people uh, to to buy your book. Then more people know about your philosophy. You know. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's true as well. Yeah, and mm -hmm. that's also part of the reason why. Yeah, we're here having this, uh, chat today as well. And yeah, we look forward to you know also putting up a published uh, review, mm -hmm. uh, on the book mm -hmm. after this as well. Yeah. All right. So Casey, thanks for all the sharing. Uh, what is the one big audacious goal or habit that you want our audience to take action now? This financial education uh, is is very lacking. You know? Investment lacking is uh, investment knowledge also very lacking. Uh. One thing for young people, uh, you must have this mindset that my career, my working, my career is important. Uh, that's where I put put on the table. But don't neglect your personal finance, right? If you want to get rich, uh, you have to do it. You have to acquire the investment knowledge. Then you have to improve yourself, reading book, uh, attending an uh, investment course. And then most of all, you must do it, uh, start investing. I am very sure you follow all this, you will be rich one day. Very good good advice, advice, good advice. Yeah. So we have a question from Daniel. So how did you grow your skill or knowledge in value investing? Was it by researching for your book or by practicing what you wrote? Yeah, I reading. Okay, reading from those uh, uh, good investors. Actually, there, there, there are a lot of uh, resources uh, uh, in the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, you do reading. Of course, you must do it, uh, uh, practice it, and use it, and improve yourself. Right? You will make mistakes along the way. Uh, so reading, doing it, uh, improving it. Also, I find that my writing also improves my, my knowledge. You know, when you write in the public forum, uh, you share knowledge, people bamboo you. you, know, you, know, then, uh, you learn. Actually, you learn through the process. When I start writing, uh, uh, Articles in IT. When I start investing, uh, last time I I'm very quantitative based. You know, I based on quantitative metrics. And, uh, slowly, you know, I I go more towards qualitative, and I find it's improved a lot, lah. Huh? Uh, so we practice write write very important also, uh, and then learn. Definitely, as yeah. as uh, you share, yeah, that, that's a uh, one of the best ways to to learn as well. Yeah. So thank you for having me here. Thank you, uh, thank you, KC. I'm glad to know you guys also through your website. You are doing great job, you know? A lot of activities, a lot of good things, personal finance and the kind of things. Very good. Thanks, Casey. Thank, thank you once again so so much for being uh, here with us. Um, we'll also be releasing after this a uh, shortened, edited uh, version, which we will be on our uh, YouTube as well as on our website. Yeah. Uh, as well. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Casey. Hi everyone, I hope you really enjoyed like the session that we had with uh, Casey. I learned a lot of things from him. Like it makes me feel like I, I go through another accounting and you know financial planning class. So but those were really useful information if information if you actually learn the techniques and then apply them and then really do a stu study thoroughly. And yep, and also he mentioned like it's best to start start early.
So thank you all for listening again. And you can find the show notes and link on our website, mypf.my slash podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you next week. Hasta pronto.